Welcome to Lecture 11 on the topic of plant growth and development. This lecture will be delivered across two parts and this is part one. This lecture is part of the subject plant physiology, which is a component of the Bachelor of Agriculture and Technology, a degree that is offered both at Melbourne Polytechnic and La Trobe University. Please visit our website at www.melbournepolytechnic.edu au for further information on this course and other courses that we offer. My name is Dr Nikki Cooley. This lecture is lecture 11 and we will be looking at plant growth and development from a whole plant perspective. This is stage 2 of this subject. In stage 1 we travel through the plant in a virtual way learning about many of the underpinning concepts that allow plant growth and develop to occur. Please ensure you have completed stage one of this subject before continuing on to the stage two topics. In part one we will introduce plant growth and define plant growth. I have included some video resources to assist you with some of these concepts. In part one, we will also introduce plant development and differentiate the difference between growth and development. In this slide, you will also be introduced to a plant called Arabidopsis. A picture of its growth from week four to week 20 is shown on the slide. This Arabidopsis is used as a model plant and much research on growth and development, particularly at the gene level, has been conducted on this plant and concepts from this evidence-based research will be described across part one and part two. Before continuing this lecture, I'd like for you to see an overview of plant growth. The three following very short uh, YouTube videos are growth of three different plants. One is Arabidopsis thaliana, which is the model plant often used for investigating uh, components of plant growth and development. The second plant is a time lapse of uh, radish seeds sprouting and where you can see both the hypercotyl growth and the root growth at the same time. And the third one is the David Attenborough Private Life of Plants uh, Growth of Fungi. All of these will give you the visualisations and we will talk in more detail in this lecture about how these components come about. Growth can be defined as an irreversible permanent increase in size. Here we have an illustration of the stages of growth of a bud. You can see year one, year two and year three growth. It is helpful to differentiate between growth and development. Growth is the cell division and cell elongation while development is the whole process, that is, from germination all the way of the different stages of growth through to death, as illustrated on this image on the slide. An observation that is perhaps quite obvious about plants is that they don't move around, they don't get up and walk and they don't run, unlike animals. Therefore, Unlike animals, they have never involved anatomy that enables mobility. Instead, plants have evolved a rigid anatomy which is adapted for the capture of light, energy and nutrients. Both of these aspects we have explored in previous topics. The rigidity, rigidity of the anatomy affects how the plant can grow. Cells are added during growth by meristems. In contrast, many animal cells migrate. The lack of mobility means that plants have to adapt through flexible patterns of development, including the regulated proliferation and differentiation of meristemic cells. Basic plant classification was covered in Practical 1 workshop of this subject. In this practical, we also looked at various parts of the plant anatomy. Please refer to this source when you are learning about this topic, as it may insist, assist in some of the concepts covered here. A saprophyte is a diploid generation of a plant or algae, 
that has a double set of chromosomes. All land plants and some algae have life cycles in which a multicellular haploid gameotype generation alternates with a multicellular diploid generation. In the figure on the slide, you can see a visual representation of a typical saprophyte. This slide draws to your attention the various scales. For example, the whole plant height is 250 millimetres, while the flower height is 3 millimetres. This gives you some concept of scaling and the role that scaling has in plant growth phases. There are three major stages of saprophyte development. The first is embryogenesis. This is the process by which a single cell is transformed into a multicellular organism, having a characteristic but basic organisation. The second is vegetative development. With germination, the embryo breaks dormancy and by using stored reserves commences a period of vegetative growth. Reproductive development is then followed. Plants make transition to reproductive development. These stages are listed on the slide for your information. In seed plants, Embryogenesis transforms a single-celled zygote into a more complete plant embryo in the seed. This process includes many developmental processes. Morphogenesis, organogenesis, histiogenesis, which is differentiation, dormancy, and finally germination. Arabidopsis is a small plant used by many plant scientists as what we call a model plant. That is, a lot of time and research funds have been spent on identifying components and physiology of this plant. This is then related to the rest of the, the plant kingdom. There are five stages of Arabidopsis embryogenesis. The first stage is the zygote stage. This is where the fusion of the haploid egg and sperm to form a single cell zygote occurs. Growth and an asymmetric division give rise to an apical cell and a basal cell. Globular stage is the second stage. The apical cell divides to form an eight-celled globular embryo. Further cell divisions generate the outer layer, the proteoderm, which will then become the epidermis. The third stage is called the heart stage. This is where rapid cell division occurs on either side of the future shoot apical meristem from the cotyledon primordia. The fourth stage of embryogenesis in Ar Arabidopsis is called the torpedo stage. Here cell elongation throughout the embryo and further development of the cotyledons. And the final stage is the mature stage. The embryo and the seed lose water and become metabolically inactive as they enter dormancy. Storage compounds accumulate in these cells. For a visualisation of embryogenesis in Arabidopsis, please stop the video here and click on the following link. The URL link to this site will be also available for your convenience on Moodle. The figure on the slide is from the Taze and Zyger recommended textbook and illustrates the stages of embryogenesis. This visualisation may be an easier way for you to remember these stages. The process begins with the initial structures of the apical and basal cells. This is known as the zygote stage and illustrated in figure 1. A. Cells continue to divide, B and C until the production of the protoderm, which is the protective layer. This is followed by rapid cell division, producing the cotyledon, as can be seen in figure E. This is then followed by elongation process and is eventually complete with the production of the mature stage. 
You will note in the mature stage it contains the shoot apex, the cotyledon, the axes and the root apex. A characteristic feature of seed plants is what is called apical basal polarity. This is a polarity in which tissues and organs are arranged in a particular order from the shoot to the root meristones. Polarity commences in the zygote. It becomes polarised in the intracellular composition. For example, the apical end is densely cytoplasmic, but the basal end contains a large vacuole. The zygote divides to give a short, cytoplasmically dense apical cell and a longer, vacuolated basal cell. The figure on the slide summarises the processes we have just discussed. This simple visualisation may be a good memory aid to remember pattern formation during embryogenesis. It is quite incredible that nearly the entire embryo, thus the mature plant, derives from the apical cell. The ap apical cell divides to generate the eight-celled globular embry embryo. The basal cell divides to produce the suspensor which attaches to the embryo to the vascular system of the parent plant. Only the hypophallus becomes part of the mature embryo. This forms part of the root apical meristem. In this slide you can see how the apical embryo divides into an 8 cell, then a 16 cell, then an early globular unit. The 8 cells of the globular embryo continue to divide by the periclinical division, that is parallel to the tissue surface to form the protoderm. Cells of the protoderm undergo anticlinical division, that is perpendicular to the tissue surface, to increase the area of a one cell thick epidermis. By the early globular, globular stage, broad areas of cells can be related to cell fate, the apical region, the middle region and the hypophallus. Now you should have a complete understanding about how the early embryo sac and cell division and cell elongation results into a seedling. The figure on the slide demonstrates the important stages of this process. The development of the embryo sac, the zygote, multiplying from one cell to eight cells to 16 cells, the early globular structure, the late globular structure, transition, late heart and finally seedling stage. During animal development, substances called morphogens play key roles in providing positional cues to cells during embryogenesis. While with plants, auxin may act as a morphogen in plant embryogenesis. Auxin is a hormone, indole-3-acetic acid, or IAA for short. It can be used to induce the formation of embryos from stomatic cells. Indeed, there is evidence in the literature to support the role of auxin in embryogenesis. The figure on your slide, 16.7 from the recommended text, illustrates the results of when you put various compounds that either inhibit or promote auxin transport and how this in turn impacts on the developing embryo. In figure one, an altered morphology was found when culturing in vitro for TENS day in a, in a compound called transcimic acid which inhibits auxin transport. Similar failure was found in cotyledon separation caused by distributing the PIN gene which is involved in auxin transport. Figure B is the wild type where no change in mor morphology was, viewed, was seen. The slide illustrates auxin movement through growth. As you can see the location of the maximum auxin or the highest concentration changes depending on what stage 
the growth is at. Stages shown vary from two cell stage, globular embryo, to early heart stage. The mirror stem is a description that we use often in this subject. It refers to a group of cells that retain the capacity to proliferate but whose fate is undetermined. There are two major meristems, the root apical meristem and the shoot apical meristem. Both of these meristems have features of def defined cluster of cells called initials and they are distinguished by their slow rate of division and undetermined fate. The image on this slide was obtained from a genetics review paper. It is a scanning electron micrograph of a young maize apex showing the shoot apical meristem at the top and in green the youngest leaf primordia or plastocronin P1, P2. These are indicated in the green colour in the figure. The following is from the Taze and Zaga recommended textbook for this subject. The sections of the chapters here I recommend that you read and make notes and insert those notes into your lecture notes at this point. Once you have listened to this lecture, watched the associated videos and read the recommended literature, you will have an overall un fundamental understanding of plant growth. You will be able to differentiate growth and development and understand the differences and how one can measure development. Two important components of plant growth is SEM and REM. Please familiarise yourself with these concepts and what they mean and the important role they play in plant growth. And finally, we've had a look at auxin, the main signal controlling growth. There are other hormones that control growth and we will be looking at them in due course too. That brings us to the end of this lecture and part one.